day for you. Uh, the, we're going to first get started with a presentation from myself on the brand new WHO standard data elements and reporting um, criteria or definitions for uh, supply chain or um, LMIS uh, data at facility and lower levels. Um, we were actually working on this all the way up until this morning. This is brand new. You're the first folks to ever see it. Uh, so that's quite exciting, and I'm, I'm looking forward to sharing it with you. Then, after our break, we are really lucky to have uh, Sakibu and Clement joining us from HIST West Africa. They're going to take us through a case study of what they've been able to do to develop a new application and support supply chain re uh, reporting in Mali and Burkina Faso. So really a lot of great innovation coming out of that team at HIST West Africa uh, and, and having some fairly uh, profound impact in supply chain um, uh, surveillance and reporting in those two countries. After their presentation, they will stay with us. And if you would like some additional support, you have questions, uh, maybe you want to even know how that you can use some of the tools and and innovations that they're going to be presenting to you in your own country or projects, they will have an experts lounge. We call these expert lounges. These are just opportunities for you to have a conversation with the folks that have the answers. Um, and, and so Sakibu and Clement will be joining us for an additional hour in the experts lounge. The experts lounge is on Slack. So I'll just go ahead and Drag Slack so you can see it. So we have two Slack channels. We have Expert Lounge for Africa and Expert Lounge for Asia. The Expert Lounge for Africa is today. This is the one that we're talking about now with Clement and Sakibu, uh, where they will be here. You can type any questions that you have for them, uh, and they will be able to respond to you here in the uh, Slack channel. Uh, you can, of course, ask questions at any point here in the Expert Lounge for Africa. You don't have to start necessarily um, uh, um, later today. You can go ahead and start putting questions in now, um, and, and they can be able to get to those uh, right when they get started with the Expert Lounge. So if you're joining from Africa um, or you're just be more interested in knowing more about what, that, what they had to say or... Um, understanding more about the tools and innovations that they will be presenting, um, then feel free to join the Expert Lounge for Africa and, and get your questions out to Sakibu and Clement. All right, I will drag this back over. Um, there, we do expect possibly some additional uh, program changes, maybe for Thursday or Friday. We're still nailing down a couple of presenters, um, but um, so just uh, hold tight on those, but then just kind of looking a little bit at tomorrow as well. Today, we are gonna go through the data elements, like I said, here a use case. Um, from Mali and Burkina Faso. Then tomorrow we are having uh, our, our local resident supply chain expert, George McGuire, he's going to be taking us through some of the indicators that we can actually build from these um, uh, data elements and reporting forms that I'm going to be presenting today. Uh, so it kind of that's kind of going full circle here a little bit. And then after George, we have another really excellent use case presentation from Mongini uh, in his Malawi and how they have... Um, uh, started to use DHIS2 as their main analytics platform uh, for supply chain monitoring. All right. Martin, Alice, any announcements that I'm forgetting? Mm, no, all good. Okay. So I will start us off uh, just to Remember a bit of a warning that we do have a word of the day coming up. The word of the day will actually be at the end of this presentation. So you got to sit through the entire thing uh, and then I'll give you the word of the day and you can um, go in and mark your attendance there. Okay, so let's get started. We are going to be talking about some supply chain data models and the, some of the data elements. And again, these are the WHO uh, data elements that have just, just been finalized uh, just a matter of a few hours ago. 
Okay. So what do we want to do? We want to make sure that you are able to understand the LMIS DHIS2 system architecture options. There's quite a few of these. We'll go over them in a bit of detail, uh, but we want to make sure that these are quite clear to you and make some general recommendations on which ones are probably the better just based upon what we've seen uh, through quite a bit of experience, but also supporting you know, what the DHIS2 platform is able to do and what we hopefully it will be able to do in the future as well. Then we are going to understand some what we call reporting maturity models. You know, yesterday I mentioned that we have different countries doing at different stages. Some are very, very basic, simple data, um, you know, maybe Excel forms or paper records, just aggregated monthly or something like that. Uh, very, very simple which is perfectly fine, uh, while other countries are much more advanced where they are tracking every individual child and they want to be able to barcode scan every vaccine every child gets to be able to connect those two and have that automatically update the supply chain or this, this stock on hand data. Uh, and then many countries in between those two extremes. Uh, so we wanna kind of cover those, uh, a, a bit of those uh, different uh, maturity models as we call them and, uh, and then um, let you know a little bit more about what DHIS2 is able or, and is not really able to support currently. Um, and then the last point here is let's just go through the uh, aggregate facility level WHO standard data elements. And we have a demo database for this set up as well. So I'm going to point you to that. And this is going to be a place where you can go in and take a look at it on your own time and actually play around with some of the analytics and some of the indicators as well. All right, so system architecture options. And this is actually a slide that I stole from George uh, presentation that he gave last week. So George, please feel free to chime in if you think I need to clarify something or I'm, I'm misspeaking about anything. But what we have here are trying to illustrate to you essentially four different system architecture options. I'm gonna start at the very top and then go one by one down through the list and let you know kind of why they're showing up here in different colors. So at the very top, you see our different levels of our supply chain system, as well as typically our HMIS, so our health system as well. So we have facility level. Then most countries above facility level have a district level. Some may have a state or a region or something like that. And then above that, many countries have a provincial level. Again, some countries may call this um, 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 like something like regions or areas or something like that. And then finally, we have a national level. Uh, we can even say this may even go further to the global level to say something like uh, reporting to a donor like uh, WHO or Global Fund or Gavi or something. So what do we have? Well, again, yesterday I presented that we actually have quite a lot of data on what countries currently are operating with. We have the uh, a Gavi, a Global Fund Assessment and WHO Assessment and a couple of Gavi reports that kind of give us a little bit of a clear idea of what countries are currently working with. Some countries, and this is the very top one, this is the gray arrow, double-sided arrow going across. They have what we call an ERP. An ERP is essentially kind of an end-to-end an -end, um, uh, electronics report electronic requisition and reporting platform. You can think about an ERP as what they use in like grocery stores or, or retail shops uh, where they are scanning and they are, and that scan is automatically ducting from a stock balance. And then that's going and routing information all the way up through to reorders and acquisitions and that kind of thing. Um, ERPs are typically uh, very, very expensive to implement. Uh, we've heard countries implementing uh, and projects implementing ERPs as efficiently and cheaply as they can for upwards of you know uh, 10 to 15 million euros. Um, again, these are systems that are typically designed and utilized for uh, large corporations, large retailers, like um, large grocery stores, that kind of stuff. Uh, and so they are very expensive. Uh, sometimes they are. Um, uh, flexible, depending upon who you are getting to supply your ERP. Um, other countries, Rwanda specifically, has reported that their ERP is extremely inflexible. 
they don't get the changes that they want made in it. It just depends on which ERP you go with, who is providing it, and how much money you're paying them. Um, so, but the long story short is most countries that we're talking about and that that you know we're speaking to right now, an ERP is not necessarily a sustainable solution meaning that they they don't have the the resources the human resources or the financial resources to be spending 15 million euros a year um and and um and it's and and the inflexibility of it oftentimes means that they're not actually getting the changes and updates to it that they actually require uh again in the case of rwanda they've actually dropped their erp entirely um and so they're not going that route anymore so the next level is a fragmented um, LMIS. And so the fragmentation here, you see these multiple red arrows. We have a different one at each level. We have a LMIS A at facility level, LMIS B at district level, LMIS C at provincial and national level. Now, a general LMIS, a logistics management information system, is designed to oftentimes uh, do most of very a lot of the similar functionality as an ERP, but it probably is not as highly transactional. And what I mean by that is that it's probably not necessarily incorporating a lot of barcode scanning and uh, doing a lot of automatic or updates of uh, stock tallies. So oftentimes in LMIS, um, uh, but 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 we do see a lot of, of similar functionalities between an ERP and what we call an, an LMIS. And sometimes the words can be kind of used interchangeably, but an LMIS is typically thought of to be something um, uh, not as complex as an ERP, uh, although certainly very, still very complex, but not as complex as an ERP and not necessarily always for a corporate setting or a business setting. Um, but getting back to the level two here, this fragmented LMIS, what we see in a lot of countries is, and I pointed this out yesterday, is that we, they have a different LMIS at different levels. So they may have, say, a paper record at facility level. You know, is it electronic? No. But is it certainly still an information system? Yes. So they have like a paper trail at facility level, and then that gets put into, say, maybe an access database at district level. And that access database at district level then may be used by a warehousing system at provincial level. And then at national level, they may have just some kind of like standard report that the warehouse system actually produces. This is actually was the case in Malawi for quite a long time where um, they had different systems at different levels. Um, and did the systems always talk to each other? No, not necessarily. Um, some oftentimes what we see is it's a very manual data transfer between these two systems. The systems are not necessarily connected, like you know, they're 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 not having some kind of uh, interoperability where they're just sharing data automatically. That the data has to be manually transferred from one to the other, to the other, to the other. And then what does that mean? That typically means that the data flow is very slow. That means that folks at the provincial and national levels don't know about issues on supply chain and stockouts at facility level until several months later. Uh, in the case of uh, one country that I worked in that will, will remain nameless, they actually didn't know about issues of supply chain until 18 months uh, at national level. They didn't know about issues at the supply chain at facility level until 18 months after that initial issue at facility level was reported because of the supply chain, because the information system was so slow, because it was so fragmented and it required so much manual transmission or uh, uh, transferring of data. Uh, another issue with manual transferring of data, of course, is it opens up a lot of opportunities for data quality issues. Uh, every time someone has to manually touch or key in data, it means that it's prone to human error. And we are all human, we make lots of mistakes. It's very easy to put in uh, 40,000 when you meant to only put in 4,000, right? But that's an order of magnitude difference. You know, saying that I have a supply of 40,000 is way different than saying I have a supply of 4,000. And that can throw off national numbers even. Uh, so 
This fragmented approach is problematic in that it has very slow data, also introduces the opportunity for a lot of data quality mistakes. There is another kind of fragmentation that I also alluded to yesterday that's worth mentioning now, and that is the fragmentation between multiple programs. So we often see that different projects and programs will have their own supply chain or LMIS system. And, you know, for example, we may have, uh, I can say again, maybe uh, use Malawi as an example, um, where the, there is an, there's a separate, there was a separate system for HIV, separate system for malaria, and a separate system for immunization. Well, over the course of a lot of, uh, a lot of hard work and a lot of good efforts, they've been managed to harmonize quite a few of these into one centralized system. But you still have a separate system for immunization. Um, and the question is, can that also be merged in together into one supply chain system? This is not just unique to Malawi. This is very, very common in many countries. Um, and the reason that this kind of fragmentation begins in the first place is that uh, oftentimes different donors, multilaterals, NGOs, and projects, they don't have the resources to develop an entire LMIS for all projects. Maybe they're coming in to just provide um, uh, 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 ARTs, like um, uh, HIV treatment. Um, and that's what they have resources to do. They have resources to pr pr uh, distribute those drugs and to monitor the use of those drugs. And that's, so then they, what do they do? They go and they, they look at the national supply chain system and they say, well, this isn't actually functioning as well as we need it to. Let's just build our own. And oftentimes they just build their own so that it is only monitoring just the drugs that they are, or just the diseases that they are working on. Again, like I said yesterday, this becomes problematic for countries to usually maintain, and it becomes quite unsustainable to have every single program with its own separate uh, supply chain system. And it becomes difficult to harmonize because usually they're, offer, they're often operating off of multiple standards, different standards, different kinds of indicators, different data elements. It also becomes extremely difficult for folks to at the facility level and the lower levels to be able to capture all this data because they're going between different uh, reporting forms, different apps, different uh, processes to report on uh, commodities that are all being stored in the same room, right? It's all in one medical stores typically, but you know, each different pro, uh, commodity or each different uh, programmatic, uh, you know, all the HIV commodities, all the malaria commodities, TB, all of these have a different reporting process. It becomes extremely difficult for folks at facility level, it becomes a, a, a big burden for them uh, to go to work through all of these different processes ultimately unsustainable typically for countries to maintain. Okay, so that's with the fragmentation. Going down one more level, we have um, some countries that are using DHIS2 as their entire uh, LMIS, you know, from facility level all the way to national level. Now, if you kind of, maybe you're picking up on the color coding here a little bit. The ERP gray is just too expensive. Most it's not really relevant to most countries. The fragmented red that's not good. Red is not red is bad. Uh, most countries find this completely unsustainable. The using DHIS two end to end, we've kind of labeled it as yellow. Yellow is like you know caution. Why are we saying that? Well, if you have a very simple supply chain system, if you're just capturing very basic aggregated data at the lower levels, and you just need to see that, that, that aggregated level, uh, data automatically aggregated up the hierarchy in your existing health information system. If you're, you're not looking at having some kind of parallel system that's just for warehousing and routing and, and, and complex supply chain functionalities and, and requirements, you're just saying, I just want to see the basic supply chain data aggregated up through my DHIS2 instance like I see my health data. Right. The very common request, especially to many countries that are just getting started with this. Um, and is DHIS2 well suited for that? I would say yes. DHIS2 at its kind of its, its bread and butter, its base uh, um, uh, functionality is to just capture aggregated data 
or even disaggregated data at the lowest levels and automatically aggregate it up through the hierarchy for you. So can you use DHIS2 as an as a end-to-end um, uh, uh, supply chain system? In theory, yes, as long as you keep the requirements fairly limited. Um, because remember, again, yesterday we talked about there are some things that a, 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 uh, a functional supply chain system requires. So a highly functional supply chain system requires warehouse management. It, requ it typically requires routing and fleet management. Um, it requires the generation of pick lists um, at, at, uh, to support kind of warehouse um, uh, operations and workflows. DHIS2 does not do this. You know, DHIS2 is not the tool for those things. And if you need those particular tools, then DHIS2 is not going to be able to get you all the way there for a supply chain system, at least not yet. And so that being said, that's why we've labeled this yellow. You can keep it simple. If you don't have complex supply chain requirements, you can use DHIS2. But as soon as you start to get into things like warehouse management and needing systems for that, DHIS2 stops being your, it cannot be your go-to tool. You need to have something else. Okay, and then we have then the last level, which is what we've labeled green. This is good. This is what we hopefully want to encourage countries to be able to adopt. And this is to have DHIS2 at the lowest level, the health facility level, community health worker level, maybe small um, district hospital level, um, and have that as your tool that you capture all the data at those levels. And then DHIS2, we'll probably need to feed that into uh, 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 LMIS that's managing warehouses and larger health facilities, or you know, like larger like regional or, or district hospitals. Um, and, and, um, and, and that carries it up through the rest of the, the hierarchy. Again, if you remember the, the example I showed about Burundi and what Medexis is doing, it's not like DHIS2 just ends at that level, at facility level. Both systems are communicating and sharing data constantly. So the folks that are looking at DHIS2 dashboards are able to see what their supply chain data at district and provincial and national level are. But the people who are actually working within the supply chain, the folks sitting in the warehouse who are filling out the orders, you know, uh, and shipping those out, they're probably interacting with a more specialized supply chain or logistics management information system that has those functionalities. And again, DHIS2 currently does not. So, um, so right now, as of today, we think that this is probably the best option, the, the, the most appropriate. Um, it does, of course, bring in some complexity of interoperability. But again, as I mentioned yesterday, we are trying to address some of these interoperability issues bilaterally with the other platforms. Um, so, uh, George, I think I would like to invite you to speak up and say anything if you have anything that I missed about this. You can just unmute yourself. Okay, thank you very much. Um... Uh, just a sh small comment um, that came up during a meeting. Uh, we write health facility just for the sake of simplicity, but this would apply to any stocks, could be a um, community health worker, could be community-based uh, based first aid. Um, otherwise, I have no other uh, comments. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Very good point. Yeah. Health facility also, yeah, goes down lower. It goes down community health worker, community health post. Uh, it can even go lower. Anyone who's actually managing uh, commodities, sometimes these are even like mother's groups or, tra or traditional health workers uh, or traditional healers, even in some countries. Uh, it just depends on, yeah, it can definitely go lower. Thank you for that point. Okay, moving then right along. Let's take a quick look at some of the various maturity models for supply chain data capture. Um, again, we are building these kinds of maturity models in partnership, close collaboration with Gavi and WHO, especially Gavi, uh, who wants to really push the push the limits on um, 
some sort of drug monitoring, especially well, immunization monitoring, and being able to connect those immunizations to specific children so that they can monitor adverse events and reactions to, to different uh, immunizations if they come up. Uh, so again, we're not just doing this in isolation. We're really working with a, a large team of global experts to try to develop these things. All right, so we kind of have what we call a three-tier approach. We have a basic aggregate reporting model, and then we're gonna go into this one in quite a lot of detail. Then we have a tracking stock approach, which is a little bit more advanced. And then the third and much more advanced, and this is really what Gavi is pushing us for, is being able, is tracking individual patients, giving them medications, and then automatically updating the stock data from the medication that we've given to the patients. Um, so let me just go into these a little bit more. Um, so the, the point to make, uh, we're gonna go through the tier one um, and I'm going to demonstrate it to you here in a minute. Uh, but the point to be made here is in this tier one, which again is very basic, just aggregate monthly or uh, weekly data coming in about each one of the commodities, we are able to actually calculate some fairly advanced indicators from this. On Friday, we'll be, I'll be showing you uh, quite technically how to actually do these indicators in DHIS2, but we can get things like closing balance, number of stock out days, adverse consumption, stock status, so we can see which facilities are stocked out, understocked, adequate stocked, overstocked. We can even calculate some resupply if that's appropriate for the commodities um, and, and, the, and the system of, of pushing stocks out. And we can also uh, calculate some order fill rates. So that's the, um, uh, the order uh, requested over the total that was resupplied. So how much did we actually get based upon what we requested? Um, so these are actually, if, you, if you're if you reading between the lines here, you can actually see I, I, we put in how these are actually configured in DHIS2, uh, but we're gonna go into more detail later. I'm gonna show you this in just a few minutes as well, uh, some examples. So again, tier one, just very basic aggregate, monthly, weekly, or some in some countries, daily stock reporting, uh, aggregated data. Stock uh, tier two is where we start to actually put some data into uh, what we call DHIS2 tracker. If you're not a DHIS2 um, expert, um, there are again, three modalities at which data can be captured in DHIS2, three different ways. The first one is aggregated data. So this is routinely captured data, um, Again, you can think about like a, a monthly health facility report, something like that. Um, the second modality is event capture. So data that's associated with an, an actual single event. And these events are not meant to be connected or related to any other events. You can think of like a uh, mass drug administration. You can think of like a male circumcision campaign uh, 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 an ITN distribution, an uh, 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 insecticide treated uh, um, nets distribution campaign, um, individual events, also like surveys, like demographic household surveys and that kind of thing. Um, these are just one-off health interventions that are deployed somewhere um, and one event doesn't connect or is not necessarily related to any other events. Then the third modality of data capture is what we call DHIS2 tracker or tracker data. And this is where we actually monitor something over time, right? This is the more transactional data. So you can think of like a, 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 an expecting mother going through antenatal care appointments, excuse me, or you can think about maybe an HIV patient coming in every, every three months uh, for, uh, um, uh, testing, uh, counseling, and treatment, um, or like an immunization campaign, where having a, a newborn follow through the, thir the first uh, um, uh, thousand days of life, going through and getting you know growth and weight monitoring and their immunizations completed. Uh, 
So these are like actually tracking typically an individual person. We can extend this to also be tracking some stocks as well. It doesn't have to be just tracking people. It can be tracking whatever you want. And we can actually configure this to be tracking some stocks. Um, and that allows us to start to build in some more advanced functionality. Um, I think one of the better ways to illustrate this is um, with uh, uh, an actual example here. So yeah, I will, yeah, let's just skip to here. So instead of talking about it in theory, I can talk about it in actual practice. In Kenya, about two years ago, we were approached by, uh, University of Oslo was approached by the uh, JSI John Snow Institute about adapting their sea stock system that was originally developed in Malawi, which monitors community health worker supplies uh, into DHIS2. They wanted something that was a little bit more sustainable than what they had developed in Malawi, although what is what they're they're still using it in Malawi for the record, but they wanted something that was a little bit more universal that other countries could adopt and be a little bit more sustainable than how they had developed this system originally in Malawi. So they came to us and said, can we put this into DHIS2? We, we worked with them for quite a long time trying to break down the, the data model and understand the requirements. And we came up on kind of a two, uh, a, a system that works quite well actually, um, that has two different kind of reporting pathways, okay? So what happens? Let's, talk, let's start at the top. And this again is for community health workers. So on the 28th of the month, the community health worker will report their stock on hand, okay? And the community health workers in Kenya are treating things like uh, kind of your, your, uh, your ICCM, so your, your integrated case care management, which is diarrheal diseases, malaria, um, uh, fevers, and some basic infections. They're also trained to um, uh, pick out warning signs um, like, like uh, bloody diarrhea or uh, hemorrhagic malaria um, and, and be able to uh, refer those particular uh, patients to um, secondary treatments or like health facilities. Okay, so anyway, so community health workers have quite a lot of commodities that they carry with them. Um, and on the 28th of the month, they, were, they, they report their stock on hand. And they do this uh, every single month in an aggregate uh, data set. Okay. Then DHIS2 automatically calculates the average consumption and they calculate the end resupply value. The average consumption is calculated over the last three months um, uh, taking the difference between what they actually received and the end at the beginning of the month, their stock on hand at the end of the month, factoring in that as the consumption, then taking the average of that, and then also saying, this is your average consumption of the last three months. This is how much then we think that you need to be resupplied next month based upon your average consumption. Um, so between the 28th and the end of the month, the community health worker supervisor, which is a person at the health facility, they see a dashboard. And that dashboard provides them the resupply values for all of the commodities for all of the community health workers, okay? And then they have about a week, about five days typically, to fill those orders, to make the resupplies, to actually have a, a, a bag for each community health worker and make sure that community health worker is getting an uh, adequate number of the commodities for uh, uh, or adequate num number of each commodity based upon the resupply, resupply value that was calculated. Um, and then on the fifth of the month, the community health worker uh, comes and actually collects the resupply and they record then how much they actually received. So DHIS2 is automatically calculating the average consumption and the resupply value and sending it to the person who can provide it. And then the, when the community health worker actually gets that resupply, they capture how much they actually re received. And that actually allows us to know what is the order fill rate? What's the difference between what they should have received versus what they actually did receive? And that order fill rate becomes very useful in kind of forecasting um, down the road uh, um, stock availability, low stock or potential stock out situations. Okay, so that's very basic aggregate reporting. That's kind of that tier one. 
But then we also built in something that was a little bit more transactional using the tier two tracker reporting. Um, and how this works is if a community health worker has a stock out, if they have a stock out or a critical low stock, then they go into the tracker and they say, I have a stock out or I have a, a very low stock. And that is what we call the enrollment. So now I'm looking at the second line here, second line here, the enrollment. And the uh, once they enroll that they have a stock out or a critical low stock, that will send an automatic SMS message to their supervisor at the health facility saying, hey, this guy or, or woman is about to run out of stock or they have already run out of stock, you need to put an emergency resupply. So the community health worker will then in stage one, acknowledge that they have um, uh, received the, the, um, uh, the, the emergency request for drugs. Then they will in stage two, res uh, fill the order and record that the order is ready. That will then send an automatic text message to the community health worker saying, your order is ready, come pick it up. And then the community health worker on the final stage three will come and collect the resupply and record how much they received. Uh, from here, we are able to calculate a few key indicators. The first one is lead time. Lead time is the time between uh, when the community health worker sends the notification to the supervisor that they have an, they have a, an emergency, uh, low stock or a stock out, and the, and the time that they actually come and collect it. We are also able to calculate stock out days. So the time at which they report, um, how many days it is from the time at which they report that they have a stock out, all the way until they report that they have uh, filled the stock and they've been resupplied. Um, so this is actually using DHIS2 Tracker. It's not using aggregate, it's using Tracker. Uh, if you're familiar with Tracker, you recognize what enrollment, stage one, stage two, stage three, these are DHIS2 terminology, but hopefully all of you can kind of appreciate the workflow here. Okay, so then we have stage uh, tier, th tier three. Tier three, again, is where we're actually tracking each individual patient and uh, recording the drugs that are being given to them. And that number from each individual patient is automatically updating the stock tally. Again, this is what Gavi uh, is, is encouraging us to be able to develop and, and, and supply to countries. Um, we are still working on this. This requires some still requires new functionality uh, that we're still developing. And um, so this is not really quite ready yet, but this is kind of a place that we're, that we're going. Uh, so if you ask me today, can DHIS2 do this? I think the answer is no. But if you ask me this next year, the answer might be yes. Um, so it's something that we're currently working on. Okay, so now let's talk about the WHO data elements. And again, we have just been finishing these up this morning. So you're the first folks to see them. What we are talking about here is kind of the lowest common denominator. So we're talking about tier one tier one, which is basic, again, routine aggregated data. And this routine aggregated data can be captured daily or weekly or monthly, okay? Um, and it's captured at hopefully the lowest level, so facility level, community level. And we have a simple reporting form, a very simple reporting form uh, that works also in the capture app in the, on Android. So what are the data elements that we are recommending? If you want to use tier one, you wanna follow WHO standards, you wanna be able to calculate all of those indicators that I pointed out earlier, what are the data elements that you need to capture? What are the data values you need to capture for each commodity uh, every month? This is what we are saying. So it's just um, six values per commodity, okay? And the first one is received. So how much stock did they actually receive during that reporting period? Okay, sometimes this is referred to as like stock receipt, uh, receipts. Then the next data element is distributed. What's the quantity of stock that was distributed as part of the patient services, right? This can be given, this can mean any stocks that were actually given out to patients, okay? 
The next one is stocks that are redistributed. Redistributed means that you have kind of a lateral transfer or a facility to facility transfer of stocks. So what is the quantity of stocks that are redistributed uh, back into the supply chain? So again, something that you send out, redistributed. Then you have a discarded. The next, the, the fourth point here is discarded. So how many stocks did you have to discard? That can be because of spoilage, uh, wastage, um, uh, expired, any reason that you're just throwing away stocks because of you know some reason. Uh, it could also potentially in some cases mean pilferage. Um, we do know that there's quite a lot of places around the world that have issues with stock pilferage. Um, you, you might be able to consider that also discarded. Uh, and then you have stock on hand. And we recommend that this is captured on the last day of the month. What this is, is just a physical count of the available stocks that are sitting on the shelf. And we recommend that you count to the lowest denominator of the stock. So you're not necessarily counting packets or bottles. You're counting number of pills, right? What's the lowest count that you can have? Um, and then we have um, number of stock out days. So in the course of that reporting period, how many days did you actually have zero stock? Right. Um, uh, and again, George, uh, you've put a lot of work into dividing these. Do you have anything to add? Not at this stage, thank you. Okay, great. So we recommend that right now, as of today, these are the only um, six data elements that you need to that we recommend you capture per um, commodity. Now, I know some of you are worked a long time in the in the logistics space. You might be saying, "No, no, no, wait about these others." Hopefully, we can answer all of your questions. We certainly appreciate that many countries are capturing much more than this. Um, and there is some there's there's quite a lot of justification for that. But just to be able to calculate all of the key indicators that we know of uh, that have been given to us from various projects and, 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 and the multilaterals and donors. These are the six um, uh, data values that need to be captured per commodity. So let's take a look at this. We don't have to talk about it in theory. Let's actually just go in and take a look at this. I'm gonna give a, a, a quick demonstration here. So let me just exit out and I am going to go to, we've set up what we call a sandbox, which is a demo instance uh, for this academy. And you can go in here and play around with this yourself. So it's who-sandbox.dhis2.org backslash LMIS. So I'm just gonna copy this and paste it into my web browser. And you'll see that we have provided you a username and password here. So you can log in as guest. You see that I have a lot of different DHIS2 instances that I have password saved for. And the password is district with a capital D, the number one exclamation point. Okay. When you log in here, the first thing that you're gonna see is this BCG stock status dashboard. This is some of the, an example of some of the analytics that we can build from some of the indicators that I mentioned earlier. We're gonna come back to this on Friday. We're gonna go over these kinds of analytics in a lot more detail on how to calculate these indicators. Um, but for now, let me just show you how we propose that this data be entered. We go to the data entry app. Okay, we have to select our org unit, of course. I'm just gonna go down to the very first health facility. And again, this is, uh, this is our training land demo database or demo country. This is not a real country. This is all demo data. And I'm gonna go to the data set that's called facility stock report uh, 2.0. Go to October, select my month, and here you go. So, 
we just have a very simple example for just two commodities or really maybe, um, uh, yeah, just, just two examples here. For one for The first one is for RDTs. So again, we capture number received, number distributed, discarded, uh, redistributed, stock on hand, and the number of stock out days. And the health facility will just come in and enter this data every month for each one of the commodities. As simple as it really can be, we've, we want to minimize the number of data values that they have to enter to a bare minimum to be able to calculate the key indicators. We don't want to capture more than what we actually use. And this is kind of the cardinal rule, the major rule for um, any kind of information system. Do not capture more than what you actually use. If you don't use a, a, a data element or a data value that you're capturing in any kind of indicator, don't capture it. Um, it's very easy to add indicators and data elements to systems. It becomes very difficult to take them away. So what I recommend is keep it simple. Keep it as simple as you possibly can. Keep it as minimal as you possibly can. Uh, and so that's why we're making the recommendation for just these six data elements currently to be captured. These again, these give us all of the data that we need to be able to capture all of the indicators uh, that, that, that WHO has defined. So um, that's, that's, that's really it. Um, you can come in and take a look at this. You can enter some data if you want. This place is, uh, this sandbox here is built for you. Uh, just a fair word of warning, you are a super user here. So you can potentially destroy this if you want. So I highly recommend well, if you do destroy it, just let us know on Slack and we'll, we'll rebuke, we will reboot uh, it. But um, if you want to come in here and play around with this and just enter some fake data, this is here uh, for you. And again, we're going to come back to this in a lot more detail later in the week when we actually start to build out some of the analytics and indicators. Okay, so I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint here. Uh, Scott, there is some comments yeah. from the audience that it's hard to read the screen when you're sharing. I believe it's from the HS2. I don't think it's possible to zoom in further, is there? It, well, it is a little bit possible to zoom in. It could also be a bandwidth issue. Um, right. But you, but all the slides, the slides are available. So if you are having an issue uh, seeing what I'm presenting, just go in, get the slides, and then you can go to the demo database yourself. You're just going to go into data entry, and you're going to you're going to select that facility in um, uh, stocks data set number two. I can probably put a little bit more information in the slides on that as well. Thank you, Scott. Okay, so we just have ten more minutes, so I'm just going to kind of try to get ahead of a few questions here as well. So what can we also do with these basic data or these basic data elements, these data values that we're capturing in that reporting form that you just saw? We can capture or we can calculate very easily a few things. And usually, and sometimes these are actually values that are captured um, that that are often captured in the same reporting form. But we're saying that we can calculate these values because there's because they can be calculated based upon the, the, the six data elements that I just showed you, they don't actually have to be captured themselves. So for example, closing balance. DHIS2 can calculate a closing balance and the closing balance can be the opening balance plus received minus issued minus redistributed minus discarded. Why, why have someone put in a closing balance when DHIS2 can calculate it for you? Now, of course, it could be necessary to put in a uh, if if the calculated closing balance is different than the than the actual closing balance. But again, what we're calling the closing balance in those six data elements is the stock on hand. So, uh, but if you want a closing balance indicator, DHIS2 can calculate that for you. There's no reason to ask that a question again. We also can do unaccounted for stock loss. So we can. 
um, look at the discrepancy between the physical stock on hand and the calculated closing balance, right? And this is actually to appreciate um, uh, if there was any kind of uh, issues in, um, if the, you know, it, it can, it's often more of a data quality check. It helps us identify if there's any missing stocks. Um, uh, and so maybe some stocks have been lost. Uh, and again, so DHS2 can calculate the closing balance. We're actually asking for the stock on hand, which is essentially a closing balance. That's a physical count. And then we can take the difference and, uh, and, uh, and uh, measure any kind of unaccounted stock loss. The opening balance is also something that DHIS2 can automatically calculate. It may seem a little counterintuitive, but really the opening balance at the end of one month, or sorry, the, the, the stock on hand at the end of one month should just be the opening balance next month, right? How do we actually get this data to transfer? How do we get that stock on hand to just move over to being the opening balance in the next month? We can actually use something called a predictor for that. And that's, a, that's a, a, a tool that we have in DHS2 to uh, move data across multiple periods or to calculate values across from data across multiple periods. So we can, and we're gonna be talking about that on Friday in quite a lot of detail. So uh, you can get something like opening balance if this is an indicator or a value that you absolutely need in your country. You can still get that value from the six uh, data elements that I showed you. Uh, you just have to configure a predictor to produce it for you. So why are we not, you know, most, many countries are, are capturing or want to capture a closing balance in the reporting form? Well, in essence, we still are because we're capturing the stock on hand, but we're not calling it a closing balance uh, because um, a few reasons, and 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 again, George, I pulled these reasons um, from what you've said uh, over the course of this, uh, quite a few conversations. So please chime in here. But essentially, we it's it's highly advisable that the folks that are operating or working at health facilities, the lowest levels, they should just be counting the values that they have on hand. We do not necessarily want to show them what their calculated closing balance should be. And the reason for that is that it becomes something that they feel that they have to match. If DHIS2 was showing them their, their calculated closing balance, which it is capable of doing, of course, then they, there would be some pressure for them to try to match the numbers. And we don't necessarily want them to do that. We, well, not even necessarily, we don't want them to do that. We want them to just say, it's the last day of the month, how much do I have of each commodity? Just count. Not, don't worry about what the, the, the calculated closing balance should be. And again, if we have these two values in the system, the calculated closing balance and the stock on hand report, then we're able to calculate the difference. And we're able to say how accurate is the data, data quality checks. Ideally, they should be a one-to-one, -one, meaning that the stock on hand and the closing balance should be the same number, ideally. So. Uh, but if they're not, then we can build out different data quality checks and alerts and notifications and indicators to help us uh, uh, to, to, to alert us to this situation. So we can use like validation rules. We can build out uh, the, the, the um, different types of indicators. And we can actually visualize these on dashboards um, and charts and that kind of stuff. So we can... Um, uh, so that we can maybe like uh, you know pinpoint the facilities that have a a difference between a a stock on hand and a closing balance. George, anything that you wanted to potentially chime in and add to this? No, thank you. So I think this is quite uh, amazing functionality that with uh, in principle a simple tool you can have this level of checks and make sure that all the the stock figures add up. Um, I think it would also be, uh, it's also important for storekeepers, you know, that missing stocks is a very sensitive issue because you could be quickly accused of mismanagement or even stealing. So I think it will be also good to, to document when you will find discrepancies. So there's a clear audit trail of uh, any discrepancy at the end of the month. Thank you. 
Right, that's a really good point. So actually in DHIS2, we can um, see an audit trail of any time a data value is changed. So we are able to actually go in and say, okay, so this was the original stock on hand reported, and then see if it was ever changed after the first value was recorded. Um, and, and monitor that change over time and, and, um, and potentially investigate it if there's any kinds of um, suspicion or, or um, necessity there. So a couple of optional data elements that some um, programs within the WHO kind of asked for, but we haven't necessarily included. We're not saying that these couldn't be added, but we just don't see them as completely necessary now, but you may want to use them yourselves. Um, you could potentially include a yes, no answer for a stock out. So you could, you know, we're actually able to calculate currently th from those six data elements, stock out in two different ways. We could say, have they ever recorded any stock out days? You know, if the number of stock out days is greater is one or greater, then the, there was clearly a stock out there. And so then there was, then we can make a, a notification or visualize that on a map saying this is where the health facilities that has stockouts. We could also say that if the, the stock on hand is zero, then they have a stockout as well, right? Um, so there's kind of already two ways that we could do this. The malaria program in the WHO thought about it might be useful to have a yes, no answer. So if you're stocked out, yes, then that could be something that we could monitor and count uh, as well. Um, it's a little bit redundant in that we're already actually able to get that data from two different sources, but, um, but it could be something that you, can, you could consider. You know, workflow-wise, it makes it very simple of saying, am I stocked out? Yes. And uh, you don't have to enter the rest of the data. Uh, also ordered. So um, the uh, WHO TB program wanted to include a, a quantity of stock items that have been ordered during the reporting period. Um, different countries do different things. Some have a push system where health facilities don't have to order anything. Other countries do have a, a system where health facilities actually have to order how much they want. Um, because of this difference, it really hasn't, we haven't really uh, put in this ordered value because it's not necessarily a universal thing. Um, so, uh, and it may not even actually be that useful because oftentimes what they order is not actually what they're supplied. Um, so, so um, we kind of have we have excluded it currently. Um, George, anything to add about these? Yes, thanks a lot. So, just a quick comment on on stockout. So, I've been working as a humanitarian medical logistician for twenty five years, but this is really a dream come true, because we routinely monitor stock availability in the upstream stocks, but of course, but uh, we have never been connected uh, to the health facilities. Uh, until now. So that's really great. And just one comment, um, as you have seen in the basic model, this is based on monthly reporting. In the With a tracker, you could consider having uh, like real-time data, but you can uh, combine those two in the sense that you could have a system where, even though we're of course not expecting anybody to count the stocks every day or every week, you could still go into DHIS to when you actually encounter stock out, hopefully that's not very often, on the fifth day or the 15th day, just uh, just change either the indicator or, or the stock and then have an upstream dashboard so that the, the logisticians who are supplying your health facility, they will not have to wait until the end of the month in order to detect the stock out. So they could have like a real time monitoring, let's say a daily monitoring of stock out and react uh, very quickly. So this would be really a great improvement in service levels where basically the health facility doesn't have to, you know, send an email or call or somehow notify, but ideally somebody would, a planner would be like screening for stock outs on a daily basis and picking up whenever there is a, a change that needs to be addressed immediately. Thank you. Yeah, that's a really good point, George. Um, this data can be, even though you know we're saying it could be monthly, you could capture this data uh, weekly, or actually in, in some countries they they capture this data daily. So if there's that zero, put it in at any point, you can DHIS two can detect it and send alerts or or flag it on a dashboard. And um, again, we'll show you how to actually produce those kinds of analytics on on Friday. 
Okay, so that is it for the first session for the day. And so now it is time for our word of the day, or in this case, we have words, three words of the day. And the words of the day are, I love DHIS2. So even if you don't love DHIS2, you still have to type it out um, and, and put it into the attendance. So please make sure that you are recording yourself as being here in the attendance um, form that's on the Google Drive, and that's I love DHIS2 is the words of the day. And you need to put that in in order to be counted as attending. Uh, and you have to have uh, your attendance to be uh, able to get your certificate. So please go in to the attendance on the Google Drive and... Um, I added the link as well in the chat. Link is in the chat, great and record yourself as being here. All right, so that gets us the end of the first session. After this, we are gonna uh, have a use case presentation from HIST West Africa. Sakibu and Clement will come and join us. Uh, so now it is time for our break. We will take a break for um, until 12.15 Oslo time. So that's just 12 minutes from now. 12.15 Oslo time. Uh, we will come back and have a use case presentation from HIST West Africa. So uh, take, you know, refill your coffee cup, grab a cup of tea, take a bathroom break, and we'll see you back here at 1215 Oslo time.